You're listening to Devo Talks. In this episode, uh, AI has a main as a big problem. It's statistics. It's mathematics. Yeah. It's not super demonstrative. People, even if they want the machine to take decision, they want to know why, just in case it failed, because yeah. it does fail something. Hello everyone, my name is Yann Masson and you're listening to Devo Talks, the show devoted to sharing the latest advances, ideas and trends in the world of business, technology and cybersecurity. Today in this episode, I had the opportunity of interviewing Gabriel Tremblay, the CEO of Delve Labs. He's also the founder of NorthSec, a large security conference and competition here in the Montreal area. He's a wealth of knowledge on everything that has to do with cybersecurity, AI, and even likes to dabble once in a while with robotics. Just an overall fantastic guy with a great sense of humor. I hope you enjoy the conversation that I had with him in the studio. So if you're at home, at work, or on the road, I encourage you to listen with an open mind, along with a nice warm beverage, and enjoy the show. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Devo Talks. I'm so glad that you joined us today. Today I have a special guest with us. He is Gabriel Tremblay. Welcome to the studio. Thank you. And uh, he's the current CEO of Delve Labs right now. I'm really excited about uh, this conversation we're going to have. So uh, first of all, let's let's get to know you a little bit more, Gabriel. Before we talk about uh, you being a CEO and everything, this journey started somewhere, right? So where where did your interest in um, you know, computers or IT, uh, what was like the first experience that really got you into this field? Well, actually, it's quite a f- an interesting story because I would say that for my generation, it's a bit uncommon. Sure. Uh, for many reasons, it was a bit late. Like uh, if I think and I talk to people around me, most of them had, well, were I'm mid 30s. So sure. most people in their mid 30 had access, early access to a Commodore. Or yeah, I, yeah. I, I think I heard you had one. <laughs> sure, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, when they were, uh, because their parents would be working in the field or something like that. But uh, I wasn't, I didn't have access to that. So I got my first computer, I was 14. Sure. So pretty, pretty advanced in life. Yeah. yeah. Uh, nonetheless, I, I was really interested in that. If, if we look at my first contact, and it's another funny story. Um, I used to go to a friend's place, they had the computer and I was a bit younger and I would be so interested in, in the beast that I would like write some basic games and yeah, I, yeah. like there was like basic, basic book back then and I would stay there and they would have like dinner with their whole family and they would let me like play with the computer in the back room. <laughs> That's so and, good. And, yeah, so that, that was a bit, I guess it was a bit awkward, but uh, I, I, I'm still friend with that person. So That's I cool. think it ended up well. So yeah, it, uh, it was quite early uh, in the days. All right. So after you, um, you know, you had early experience with some computers and stuff, what, uh, did you go to college or university to study um, uh, computer science or? Yeah. So once I got this computer, obviously it was done for me. Yeah. Uh, the, 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 well, they say it was settled for yeah, life. It was settled. Yeah. Um, so I was really, really into my computer to a point where it, it became to be a problem. Like many, <laughs> of, many children of my, of my age, like back then, uh, there was no like, you know, parent oversight. They wouldn't understand sure. that. So we were like 100% of the time on our computer. Yeah. So it really quickly led me to uh, college. Uh, mainly I became a network uh, administrator. Back oh, then. okay. Uh, but uh, it was not enough, so I decided to move to Montreal and go for a baccalaureate in uh, software engineering. Okay. After that, very neat, very neat. Yeah. Um, after that uh, the experience, so I'm sure you made friends in college and uh, and, and learning about uh, things. Where did your direction head? Where because. Uh, IT is such a big world. You know, yeah. you could be a network administrator, system administrator, you could be a CEO, you could do all sorts of stuff. Um, what led you to the path you chose, which I guess it would say maybe security or cybersecurity? Or how, what, what were the steps that went to the next? So I kind of took the shotgun approach. Okay. I really liked everything from programming to network administration to cybersecurity to process. I I've, I've did software engineering after all, so I'm still as of today pretty interested in, in agile process and how okay. you make team make good product sure. so it's still a passion so i started really as a developer uh, mainly in innovation um for, i worked for ericsson and a couple of uh, small places like that and i ended up at iweb back then uh, back at the time and then i started as a developer but i quickly became a team leader uh, so I, I think it was my first days of, of management back then so i helped the team uh, build an agile environment 
And in the meanwhile, I was doing a lot of security competition with the friends I've met in university. Well, but even back in the university, we were doing that. So I did everything at the same time. And at some point after living the software engineering experience, uh, I felt that I was starting to give talk on cybersecurity. I was making a bit of open source tooling for security. So some people started to ask me, why don't you just come and work in cybersecurity? And then I kind of jumped into the occasion. Sure, so it sure. led me to that path slowly, but it didn't yeah, yeah. took too long. I think it took me uh, five years okay. after graduation. Sure, sure. Um, now with this passion for all things uh, cybersecurity, I think, um, you know, I, we, we talked about earlier the idea of this uh, security competition came up. So uh, you uh, helped found NorthSec, right? Can you explain a little bit about what this uh, competition was about, how it started, and, and what you actually do there? Because some people may not understand how a competition so, happens, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So quickly said, NorthSec, if we speak about the NorthSec of today, it's a, it's a large cybersecurity event okay. that combines trainings, workshops, conference and still a CTF and a okay. CTF is a, a capture the flag event where people will try to do security uh, I would say hacks okay. or yeah. well, security uh, levels yeah. or challenge to win a contest sure. uh, there's many types of them you can do some on the internet there's uh, free ones uh, Defcon has been running one for, for a very long time yeah. and if you look at Nordsec the one that they organize, well, that we organize, is uh, an on-site one. So the only way to participate is to be live in the room. Okay. And as we speak, we're the largest one in the world okay, in, well. that, in that specific um, style. Yeah. Uh, it, it's, it's huge. You need to see it to understand what's the, what the scale of the thing. So how, how did it start? So there were some conference in Quebec, uh, and there was also some, co some competition. Okay. So what happened really was that uh, we had a team in, in uh, Montreal that we call the CISSP Groupies. And the idea of, of that team that was, uh, I would say, multi-school, a big like a friend a group from multi-origins, and we would do international CTF. So we would like spend uh, two or three days uh, just hacking stuff in the, in the contest, and then try to win it. And there was two problems. One, we only had, I would say, one really good competition back then, and it was called Hackus, and it was in Sherbrooke. So we went there, we, we won it a couple of times, and then we joined the organization to help them, because at some point you need to help also. It's always free and volunteer-based. Uh, but Hackus had a couple of, uh, of shortcomings. It was in Sherbrooke. So it was hard for them to scale because of sponsor location. You, if you wanted to have a conference to hack us in Sherbrooke, I guess it's a bit far. So they had a bit of shortcoming. So unfortunately, it ended up uh, ending. Like it failed. Like a year, there was no hack us. Okay. Uh, so the year after, I decided that I wanted to take back and then rebuild based on the Hackers Foundation, okay. a new organization that would go further than just having a CTF. So I've contacted some of the old organizers that I really wanted to work with. We've built a larger team with different people and we really aim to make a, first we started with a very good CTF in Montreal. And then after that, it's funny because uh, we created the conference because we needed money to fund the sure. CTF. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we created that, that conference and then to fund the conference, we ended up creating yeah, that makes trainings. sense. Yeah. Uh, as we speak today, Nortec is still a nonprofit. Okay. Uh, nobody's paid at any level. Of course, there's some external contractor. Sure. But it's it's I would say really clean in the way it manages finance. Uh, it Nortec still tries to take as less as least as they, as they can money from sponsors. Not because they don't like them. It's just because to, they want to keep independent. Sure. So as we speak, it's like it's now. Well, it, it has been for a while the largest cybersecurity event in Quebec. Uh, last year, it was 1,200 people. Okay. This year, it's going to be probably 1,500 people. The growth has been uh, steady since a couple of years now. It's the seventh or eighth year this year. So it's mm. been running for a while. Nice. Yeah. So I've, I'm not, I used to be the president, and I'm not the president okay, anymore. Okay, sure, sure, yeah. Uh, when Delve, and we're going to get there at some point, yeah. uh, grew, it was hard to have two uh, president role in two companies. Makes sense. So I had to give uh, 
to 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 let, let, give my place to someone sure. that did a wonderful job. The event is even better than when I ran it. So that's cool. That's great. That's great. It seems like there's a lot of uh, the more and more I hear about uh, entrepreneurs and people that work in IT. There's a lot more. We talk less about competition, more about collaboration. You know, people helping each other out. Competition. Co uh, yeah, competition. <laughs> that's exactly. That's exactly. Yeah, it's true. Uh, but uh, I, I think it's great to um, to really. Uh, you know, pass the torch on to other people, you know, and so that you can you can focus on the things you want to do. Um, so, Dev Labs was the next little, your little brainchild that you did. So, how did this come? I mean, obviously, cybersecurity is like uh, I was talking to one uh, our CISO, and it's a lot of times people say, oh, "I've been a cybersecurity professional for you know 10, 15 years," but cybersecurity is actually very new, uh, pretty yeah. pretty new. You know, uh, back in the day, the, the problems were different. Um, nowadays, the issues are expounding, you know, exponentially. I would say they're that different, but they are bigger, uh, bigger, complex, bigger, yeah. and it seems to affect more people, you know, yeah. uh, in a, in a more personal way. You see, well, all the, <coughs> the hacks and security breaches and things like that. Um, so Delve came along, and so how did that start? So you started it, you know, the typical ideas the guy started in his basement, you know. But how did this concept start for you with uh, creating a company and really? Trying to do something unique because we'll talk about AI a little bit later. But so uh, when I said earlier that I like to shotgun things, sure. At the same time I was doing NordSec, I was also starting my career as a security professional. So I had the chance to be a pen tester around 2012, um, where it was still very rare to see people in that field in Quebec. So yeah. it was a bit of a crazy life working with large uh, corporation and just trying to hack their network, of course, legally and in a, in a provided scope, but it was a wonderful time. Yeah. So we, I did that for a couple of years. And at some point I had a pretty good vision of what my large customer had in terms of problems. Uh, it was pretty clear. So being someone from software engineering, I really wanted in my life to start to build a product to help people. And uh, it's not that I didn't like service, sure. but I wanted to build something. I'm a maker and yeah, yeah. we'll talk about that a bit later on. Um, so I started with that, that idea that, well, it was not more an idea, it was more a, a uh, realization yeah. that if you took any of my large customers and, and to be fair, any large customers, in terms of what we call vulnerability management and scanning for, for uh, exposed vulnerability, uh, none of them were scanning more than 40 or 50% of their, uh, of their network. Wow. And then I, I found that a bit curious back then. So we started in 2000, uh, early 2013, 14, like you see shotgunning always at the same sure, time, yeah, yeah. Uh, thinking about this idea. And what we, we, we started to do was to build that platform that would happen to be able to scan 100% of network. Uh, and then we've built that. So we've built this, this autonomous scanner that would do discovery of all your asset, discovery of all your machine, the IoT device, websites, like everything that could be found on the network will be automatically found, uh, would decide what was the best solution to do a security scan on that. Would it be a DAST scan? Would it be a system scan, perform these scans, and then try to reduce false positive and bring a good result. All oh, that man. autonomously. So we built that idea, and unfortunately, we realized that we were part of the problem now. <laughs> because what we, we really realized was that one of the reasons why these large customers wouldn't scan all of their network is because they had too much to do oh. after that. So many results that it will be drowning in results. Sure. And we were coming and saying, here's more results. Yeah, yeah, no, it makes sense. So this is where we decided to uh, think about AI. What could we do with that? As you, as you, as you discover this, this challenge, right? You know, depending on small business or large business, it doesn't matter. They all have similar issues, except on bigger scales. Um, so you, you decided to touch the concept of AI. Now, obviously, when, it, when we think of AI, Everybody has their own idea. You know, they think of like the, the AI toothbrush at one point, there was one at a CES somewhere that, you know, that can scan your mouth or whatever, you know, and or AI, we think of like the movie Terminator or something like that. But the idea is, what is the actual, how does the AI work? You know, what is it doing and how does it alleviate or help you with your, with the solutions that you offer an enterprise, you know? So 
information. I am not an AI scientist. Sure. I know about it because I hire people that know a lot more than I do about that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I think the first thing you learn when you meet with these people that are expert in the domain, they will tell you that AI is not a lie, but it's just a fancier way to talk about statistics. Sure. Uh, what we've realized in our problem, if I get back to Delft, was that we had a scaling issue. We had a problem where, where the noise was becoming so high that it was creating a problem in itself. Mm. And one of the reasons why we did create AI was to manage like large amount of data and draw conclusion and try to figure out thing on these very large scale, uh, a very large data set, I would say. So when we realized that we had this problem, that we had a lot of vulnerabilities that we had problem to categorize, figure out, which was a uh, false positive and for which reason we invested in AI. What we do is instead of trying to figure out what's the context of a vulnerability externally, uh, like many legacy product will do, we really focus on figuring out the operational context of the client. So we don't put our effort about looking on a specific vulnerability. We put all of our effort learning about how a specific network functions, what is important for the customer. That's the, re that's the main question we try to answer every day is, without the customer telling us, can we figure out what's what is important for him? And once we, once we know that, we can take this vulnerability, do like the legacy one and take AI on, on the context. But bringing that together really brings a level of understanding about every single result we bring. So that's why we went to AI. So we could provide out of these millions of, of vulnerabilities, what, do you, what are the 50 most important for you uh, that you need to fix today regarding your very own context? So that's, that's helpful because a company, like you said, it's overwhelming and sometimes you, you can almost like shut down because you say, we can't handle all this, let's deal with something else, you know? But you guys having that, I guess, that conversation or showing the priorities to them can help them in their security strategy, yeah. right? As, as they're trying to target what are the things that are the most difficult, yep. the biggest vulnerabilities. And, and well, it's a, the thing you, you just mentioned barely, but is super important in AI. Uh, AI has a, main, has a big problem. It's statistics, it's mathematics. Yeah. It's not super demonstrative. Sure. So a uh, thing we, we've... Uh, learned to hear really often uh, in the beginning was show me the AI. Yeah. Why do you want me to show you the AI? Yeah, sure, yeah. Like, here's the AI. Yeah. So uh, figuring out innovative way to have the client understand what the AI did is also really critical. Mm. Uh, because people, even if they want the machine to take decision, they want to know why just in case it failed, because yeah. it does fail sometimes. Sure. Yeah. So it's also really important. It's good to do AI, to uh, make the, build these method and technique to demist, well, make, make it more effective, yeah. but you also need to show what's happening to the user uh, in order for them to trust the machine. So, but, it's, but it's a good harmony. We're not just letting the thing do its thing. It's understanding what it's doing to help them. That's really neat. But it, I guess it does give you an advantage over a, what we'd call a legacy product, a product that maybe doesn't use AI, right? Um, so what would be the, 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 I guess, the advantage of you guys using AI versus somebody who's not using one in your product set? So what can you offer people? So if we're speaking globally about not using or not using AI, I guess that if you want to do scale, it's unavoidable. Okay. Either you pay millions of people well, not millions, maybe thousands of people sure. to, to figure out what is important for you, or you let the AI do it. You let Delve AI do it, yeah, like we sure. do at Delve. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's the difference between doing and not doing. Now, the difference between us and more, because the legacy product are catching up, they are also integrating AI. They kind of figured out that it was important. The main difference is the focus. Okay. Where are we applying this learning? Are we applying it to the external world or your world? And mm -hmm. that's the big difference we have at Delve. We think that your world is most important, and after that, the rest is a, it's another factor. One of the things we touched on earlier, uh, because like you said, you have that shotgun approach, so there's always, you, have, you have your hands on a lot of different things. Uh, tell me a little bit, I'm kind of intrigued by your passion for uh, robotics. You said later on in life, you, you got into robotics. I know sometimes people think about AI with robotics. You know? How does this, uh, on, on a side note, what are, the, some, what are the, some things that intrigue you about robotics? What do you do with them? Have you, uh, what, what are your projects you're working on? Well, I, I, I would say that the first goal of robotic in my life is to create a sentient life of 
robot that could rule our world. <laughs> yeah, perfect. I guess I first thing. First thing. No, no. <laughs> no I, I guess that robotics, robotics alone helped us already in many fields, uh, specifically in, I would say, jobs or work that are, that, that are, that could probably not be done by humans. Sure. Like there's stuff that if you're doing the same gesture for the, for a whole day, even if it's your job, it might not be the best thing for you to do. So it's a different topic, but robots help us do a lot of that. Mm. Uh, let's say remove people from misery jobs. Yeah. Uh, but it also helped us scale, be more efficient. And now we're arriving to, uh, into a different paradox where now we have, and it's all, always the same thing, as we get more advanced in, in, in AI and self-learning machine and autonomous machine, um, I guess that more traditional world will, will have to feel robotic also and get to learn about them. And my main topic of interest is how we can introduce large-scale robots or robots in more conventional fields. Mm. Uh, and I'm not speaking about automating stuff, but doing tasks that, that are typically that require sentient people. Uh, I would say like large-scale farming is an example. Okay, wow. Interesting. Like, of course, you have like these GPS-enabled uh, tractor. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's true. But, but it's not fully robotized farm it's it's a different idea yeah, yeah i wouldn't say i would go there but it's it's kind of the idea i have and i think about it's how can we bring robotics and learning to robotize large-scale industries wow. from beginning to end cool um now any are do you do uh any robotic things at home be obviously to test these ideas well obviously uh, like uh, every uh homemade uh, robot is just, uh, i think a uh, 3d printer has been a big part of my life for the past uh eight, eight to ten years now yeah, yeah. Uh, i've built my own i designed my own i released an open source one recently cool. which i've built totally so part of it and i'm always building small robots to do various things uh, of course uh, sometimes it doesn't look like a robot but sure. if it has a motor and some code it's kind of a robot okay it does something yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. if you had a, there, there might be some younger folks uh, listening maybe somebody that either in college or university and they're kind of interested in a robot what would be a good place to start honestly that's a very good question i guess that I, I'll I'll speak for my my own uh, my own church there. Yeah, yeah. I I guess that three D printer three D printers are an amazing way to start robotic okay. because you can cheaply acquire one now these days that you can easily modify and program. They're fairly dangerous, so okay. it's cool for for kids. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, they need supervision, but yeah, yeah, yeah. it's it's a bit exciting because yeah. it's not like a dumb thing that doesn't do, and it builds stuff. That's cool. So it's super interesting. Well, I, I don't know if you want to start earlier in life. Sure. That I don't have kids. Uh, no, 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 I don't no, have no. kids, but um, I would say that if you, if you have like a teenager or pre teenager that want to get into robotic, get a three D printer and have them modify it. All right. Okay. So enough about robots. Um, Let's let's get back to so main field that you're in obviously is cybersecurity. What are some of the biggest threats or challenges that you see as you are working in the field every day? What's coming up down the so, pipe? For small business, it always uh, it always turns around one or two main main challenge. Okay. The first is they they are unstaffed and they don't have the knowledge for it. So there is a lot of small things that they could do that they just don't know about. So <clears throat> first, the challenge is getting help, uh, getting properly informed. And it goes from uh, basic security politics to having your stuff up to date and paid for. Uh, one of the disadvantage of having a copy of Windows on your, your computer is you're not getting the updates. Uh. So the, first, the next time a ransomware goes live, you're the first target. And you're not even targeted by a malicious entity, you're targeted by a robot. But since you're not up to date, you're gonna get hit all the mm. time. So that's always like doing backups, like small, small things that will keep your business alive. Because let, let me be clear, if you're a very small company or you have like 10 employees and you're in the manufacturing sector and you get around somewhere, there's a good chance your business is gonna end there. Uh, it happens sure. because you can't recover from that. Yeah. You're gonna lose your prod. Yep. Uh, if you're a very large enterprise and you get hacked, it's a totally different scenario. You're gonna have loss, but you're gonna stay alive. So if you are in a, a larger enterprise, let's say you're in, a, in not a small company, but a large enterprise, what are some of the different threats that you'd see there and maybe how to handle them or some, some things that would be so, very... Uh, large enterprise, it's, it's a whole different world that has so many aspects. Like cybersecurity in a very large enterprise is, is a society in itself. It's almost like buying a security firm and, and 
putting sure. it into so it, it goes from managing like uh, data access employees software updates you need to to know what you're exposing because a truth is what we do at delve if we find your vulnerabilities and you're a large very large company uh there's almost no chance you're going to be able to fix them all mm. it's sad but it's life so you need to figure out what's important for you and it always comes to the the fact that for large enterprise it's a process a process that needs to be improved worked on and figuring out what's the most important regarding to your business your enterprise what you're defending yourself against so it's a whole different world but it's definitely something that's affecting us um any any things that you see coming down in the next couple of years what are some of the biggest challenges in maybe just the world of it what are some of the technologies and things that are going to be coming out that we really should be paying attention to something either cool or something that could be challenging you know well let's start with the scary stuff yeah, yeah, yeah i sure. guess that the, the next big thing is what we call iot okay. uh now i guess that the world is now splitting iiot and iot which is industrial iot okay everything that can control a dam a rail and iot which is all the small device we have at home that that interacts with our networks yeah. in we're starting to get into the world where iot is a problem okay. uh most of the most of the reason is our nobody wants to pay too much for these toys. Like most mm. of the time when you have a connected doll, you don't want to pay 300 bucks for it. If you sure. can get it for 50 bucks, you're gonna get it for 50 bucks. Yeah. The problem is that when you pay that price, you won't get support, it won't get updated. And it's gonna be done as quick as possible. It just makes sense. Mm. Um, and it used to be a lesser of a problem because the chip that would control the doll that lights their lead wouldn't do much more than just like saying hi. Yeah, yeah. But now it's becoming cheaper and cheaper to put a full Linux sub subsystem in there oh, yeah. because it simplifies also the programming. You don't need to have an embedded programmer anymore. A Python programmer is going to do the job. It, it runs Linux, but it also connects to the network. Yeah. So it, these devices are multiplicating, multiplying. Uh, yeah. And it's, it's, it's becoming more of a problem and it's gonna become more of a problem because they proliferate. You, you're gonna find them in place where you don't expect to find them uh -huh. uh, more and more. So uh, being able to handle the scale of these device and at some point probably putting regulation on what could be updated, what they can do. Like if you look at the FCC or the, the CRTC, if you have a radio device, there's limitation about what it can do. It cannot emit, it cannot transmit to a certain point. It needs to be uh, uh, resistant to that and that. So sure. in cybersecurity, we're gonna have to think about some limits that these connected device can have if they can't be updated properly, yeah. like a certification, because yeah. it's gonna be really messy quick. Yeah. Second is people also, really, we like AI, people like AI, mm -hmm. but AI is a statistic. Uh, we need to be careful about what we interpret also from AI. Mm -hmm. AI is not a silver bullet. Like now you see people that have ridiculous idea about AI and you, you speak about it like the sure. AI toothbrush and people that think that, I don't know, space time is something they can solve with AI. Sure. I would, I would, stay calm about that i would say you know there's it's not a silver bullet there's many things you can't do yeah. with that and yeah, even yeah. if you think you can there's a big chance you can't um now talking about more of the maybe exciting things coming up uh besides the uh the iot there's some great devices out there but we have to be careful because there's gonna be some regulation and stuff right um what are some things that you think are exciting to see some new technologies things that are developing now that you think this is gonna be really cool to watch in the next year or two ai yeah <laughs> there, there you go <laughs> because, because or how they use it right yeah, yeah because when it's well used and it helps reducing this the attack surface and understand uh, the problem it's amazing like it really do it today if i look at what we do and even what the, our competitor does uh it's already providing really amazing uh, data that, that is useful for that. So that's a good thing. Um, I would say we should uh, still continue to, to invest a lot in broadband and, and network, even if it's an old school thing. Sure. Um, the more we connect, the more the attack surface becomes. Of course, it's a bit sad, but the, we can do even more things with that. So I'm not that scared of that, of yeah. IoT, but you know, it's finding a place in the middle. Sure. Uh, in cybersecurity tech, I, I, I couldn't say. The reason is it's, it's fragmented. There's so many good ideas, but they are in a sea of legacy solution. Mm. And we're gonna have to tidy up all of that at some point because it's now so noisy that the best idea keep sometimes just disappears because there's still too much noise. All right, so uh, we, we mentioned that we talked about AI, we talked about robotics, we talked about uh, a little bit about um, some of the, uh, the projects you've worked on. Now, if, uh, if somebody's interested, a lot of, like I said, uh, there's young people watching and people are even older people that are switching careers. 
uh, and they're interested in going into cybersecurity because we need more people working for cybersecurity. So what would be some of the avenues or paths? What are some things they can discover to try to get into that field? So unfortunately, uh, the, the, I would say the school system is not there yet. It's, it's becoming more and more uh, mature. Uh, Polytechnic now is starting a program, but it's more for people that are to a, of a certain age, sure. even if they're still young. Uh, so I think like many things in life, like if you want to get into archery, what do you do? You find an archery club. Yeah. And what a great thing, uh, the great thing is happening is that the communities are getting bigger, bigger and better. Yeah. So if you're interested in cybersecurity, you should figure out what is your local community. Speaking about Montreal, I would say, uh, think about um, Montréal, which is a monthly event that takes, you with, uh, that takes your hand and show you how to do basic security challenge and sometimes quite advanced security challenge and will bring you to the world of legit competition where you can practice your, your trade without doing criminal activities. Sure, yeah. If you're in Quebec, there's all the ACFEST um, community, which is great. Uh, also, they do also a CTF and a conference. Okay. Uh, I will go look there. And almost every major city now has some kind of community. So get along them. Even if you're, you're not even uh, 18, they will still take you because it's not like adult only. It's, sure. it's properly made. I uh, like uh, the one in Montreal is sponsored by uh, by Spotify. It's at their office. So it's oh, great. Cool. It also show you that there's also other careers. Yeah. So so go there, go in your communities, uh, start to do CTFs, competition, go to conference if you can afford it. Uh, often they have uh, student rebate. Uh, do research on your own. It's exactly like programming. If you want to learn programming, if you just wait for school to teach you, you won't be a very good, sure. very successful programmer yeah, in yeah. life. No, you will yeah. become a very... Uh, as average programmers. Sure. So do stuff, start a project, take a device, remove yeah. the screws, figure out something. Yeah. Um, so do a lot on your side, then look at for more training. Um, I always say it, if you go to university, uh, engineering, is, uh, engineering is pretty good, uh, but basically it's more the people you're gonna meet yeah. that will change your course. So go at any university and figure out who's in cybersecurity and get along with them. That, that's encouraging though because it gives people options, and I think, like you said, um, now we're living in a world where these things are very accessible, right? So it's up to you. Like, if you want to find a career, you'll find ways. You know, get with the community, talk to people, uh, and uh, and just get involved. And I think that's a great uh, it's a great way for them to get um, for people to really really understand what cybersecurity is and, and maybe make a career or a life yep. out of it. It's a lot of fun too. Yeah, no, it is. It is. It's 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 still as of as of today an amazing career. Uh, there's stuff you can do in cybersecurity that you won't be able to do sure. in many other industries, mainly because of the uh, low low uh, availability of resource. Salaries yeah. are pretty good. It's yeah. it's still a pretty nice career. Very cool. Well, um, man, I think we had a great conversation today with all sorts of different uh, uh, different technologies. We talked about all sorts of different things. Is there um, uh, if somebody wants to get in contact with you? or uh, they want to learn a little bit more about Delve and what you guys do, where's the best way to reach, uh, reach you? So I would say, uh, don't reach me on LinkedIn. Okay. I am super paranoid about that. <laughs> if I never met the person, I never connect. Sure. Uh, we have a contact form on the website, which is, it looks like any other contact form, but it's actually uh, wired directly in the, into our customer success team. Okay. So you, you won't be taken by a robot. It's, it's actually a real person that knows about what the product could bring you that will talk to you. Sure. Uh, if they want to get, uh, if they want to talk to me specifically, uh, I would say, um, Try, try to meet me in, in some of these community events or try an email, we never know. Yeah. <laughs> I, I do read my mail, so. Yeah, it's good. But mostly when it's not spam, I will read them and respond. Sure. Well, anyway, thank you so much for coming uh, on the show with well, us thank today. you for inviting me. I'm excited and I think it's, uh, I wish you all the best success with Delve. No, thank you. And your future robotic projects as well. If they happen to <laughs> if be, they maybe happen. it's gonna be something else at the same time. <laughs> exactly, yeah, sure, <laughs> sure. Uh, but anyway, um, thanks a lot for coming. And I think, I think this is great for, our, I think our community will love to listen and, and watch if you're watching on YouTube. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, make sure you like the video and subscribe to our channel and also check out their videos as well. Check Delve Labs web uh, LinkedIn page and like it. Okay, as well. And uh, if you're listening on one of our uh, audio podcast format, go ahead and heart it, uh, like it, uh, review this show and uh, give us some love and uh, we appreciate it. But anyway, thank you guys so much for watching again or listening. And thanks again, Gabriel, for coming with thank us you. today. I appreciate it. Thank you so much.